Hi, hello, hi. So welcome back to Queer History with Aaron and Sweeney. I'm your host, Aaron and Sweeney. And today I want to talk to you all a little bit more about some queer history. Uh, last week we spoke about the Stonewall riots and a little bit about Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera. This week I want to talk a bit about trans, a bit about trans medical history and how it was impacted by the World War II Nazi book burnings. Before we get into this, of course, trigger warning, we're talking about World War II Nazi Germany. So trigger warning Nazis, trigger warning violence against the LGBT community, of course. I just want you to be prepared for what we're going to talk about because I know it's really difficult for a lot of folk to hear, so. So I wanted to talk about this because it's something a lot of people don't actually know. So I know a lot of people are familiar with the Nazi book burning. So some of you may know the Nazi book burnings were a campaign constructed by the German Student Union to ceremonially burned books in Nazi Germany and Austria in the 1930s. The books targeted for burning were those that were viewed as being subverse or or as representing ideologies that opposed Nazism. But a lot of folks don't realize the significant impact that the book burnings had on the trans community particularly um, in terms of medical advancements of gender affirming surgeries. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that today. So prior to World War II, after World War I, uh, Germany was actually pretty queer. It wasn't perfect, don't get me wrong. There were still some, you know, attempted cures for homosexuality and strange surgical procedures and a whole bunch of really unpleasant things, but there was a relatively open LGBTQ community starting to surface, and although they were still under anti-sodomy laws, law enforcement wasn't really enforcing these rules. So things were kind of looking up. And the queer scene was actually like known throughout Europe. I know that there's a word, I think in Italian, Italian gay men and women were actually referred to as Berlinese or something like that. I just, I, I remember hearing that, but anyway, um, it was a thing that like Germany was the queer place to be. But particularly what I'm going to focus on is the medical aspect of it, the medical field and the advancements being made in Germany and what happened there. So, so I'm going to do my best to pronounce names and places as well as I can, but please forgive me if I'm bad at it. So there was a doctor named Magnus Hirschfeld. Magnus Hirschfeld headed the institution for sexology. The actual name of it is Institute für Sexualwissenschaft, but it roughly translates to Institute of Sex Research or Institute of Sexology or Institute for the Science of Sexuality any of those, so I'm gonna use those words because I am not very good at pronouncing the other one. So the Institute was a nonprofit organization. It was founded in Berlin and it was run by the Scientific Humanitarian Committee, which was a group that campaigned for gay rights and tolerance. So this Institute was actually really cool from what I understand. I'm not a historian, but again, just from my research, um, the Institute advocated for sex education, contraception, the treatment of sexually transmitted diseases, and women's emancipation, just like to name a few things, which is really, wild to think about if you think about the year that this is happening in. This is in like the 1930s. And on top of that, at the Institute, trans people were actually on staff, like openly out trans people. And trans activists were actually given the opportunity to advocate for themselves at conferences hosted by the Institute as well. So it's just really stellar stuff going on there. So at the Institute, various endocrinologic and surgical services were offered, including the first modern sexual reassignment surgeries of the time. Here's something that I particularly find cool. So Hirschfeld actually worked with the Berlin's police department to try to reduce the number of arrests of cross-dressed individuals, basically trans women, because they were often arrested because cross-dressing was considered illegal, because it was considered to be in correlation with sex work. It was a whole thing, but uh, he was trying to basically reduce the criminalization of trans women and the arrests of trans women through the creation of something that sounds problematic, but just bear with me, by giving them transvestite passes. It was a different time, listen. So these transvestite passes would be issued on behalf of the Institute, and they were to confirm a person's individual desire to wear clothes that are associated with the opposite gender from the one that was assigned to them at birth. And one of the trans women that Hirschfeld actually intervened on the arrest of, on behalf of the Institute, actually went on to be like one of the first to take advantage of the Institute's pioneering sexual reassignment surgeries. And also Lily Elb, the real life person that the Danish girl was based off of, she also underwent surgery at the Institute, so that's 
cool fun fact. With all of his research, Hirschfeld built a huge library where he wrote and documented and also collected work about queer sexuality, about trans people, and this archive was actually so renowned that people across the world, if they would be doing research on sexual reassignment surgery on trans people in the medical field, they would sometimes even publish their work in German before publishing it in their native language because it was just, it was that well known. That was like the place to go. That was the research center. But unfortunately, on May 6th, 1933, Nazi demonstrators raided the libraries of the Institute of Sexology and took more than 20,000 books and they were burned a couple of days later. Hirschfeld's early publications had laid the groundwork for his profile to rise to fame until he became one of the most prominent LGBTQ activists in the world at the time. He even co-wrote one of the first gay characters to appear in a film. It was for 1919's film different from the others, which I think is cool. That's a long time ago. That's a hundred, literally a hundred years ago. <laughs> anyway, in 1904, he published a book, Berlin's Third Sex. This book was an early look at gender variance in 20th century Germany, which apparently had a thriving drag scene and trans community. This was all documented. So between his published work and his prominence as the founder of the Scientific Humanitarian Committee, which began in 1897, and the World League of Sexual Reform, which was founded in 1928, rendered the Institute one of the first medical facilities in the world that could provide gender affirmation surgery for trans people who wanted them. But the Nazis' destruction of the Institute's library destroyed all of the medical records, which contained detailed notes about nuances of the complication of some of the procedures alongside plenty of personal notes, thoughts, stories, studies on LGBT people, and it didn't end there. The Nazi youth continued to harass Hirschfeld. There were plenty of violent attacks against him and against the Institute, and he ended up being in exile until he died two years later after the Institute was raided by Nazis. So why am I telling you this? Why is it important? How does it link back to today? Well, there are a lot of reasons why this is important. Firstly, it's important for history to not repeat itself, especially with all the anti-LGBTQ stuff that's going on and like LGBTQ centers getting attacked and it's just there's there's a lot going on it's not okay and we should not be taking steps backwards we should be taking steps forward so it's just don't repeat the same mistakes but also I think it's really important to talk about lost queer history and especially like lost trans history because there are so many people who see trans folk and they're just like where did they all come from we didn't have trans people before they all just popped up it must be because of the internet and it's like it's not it's not really, it's not really like that. Trans people have always existed. We're just very frequently erased. This isn't the first time that trans folk have been erased from history books. Like, I'm not going to get into it in this video, but like a lot of the First Nation communities that were colonized had two-spirited individuals and they had their own history. It's just a lot of it has been erased. It's almost like people have been trying to cover up queerness and cover up trans people, and then in the future are like, look, see, there weren't any, but it's like, nope, always been here, just very resilient. So I think it's important to talk about this stuff because sometimes folks don't realize that it's like, trans people have always been here. There are medical records that date back past the 1930s of research on trans folk and gender affirming surgeries, and it's just, I don't know, I just think it's one of those things that maybe we should talk about a little more and that I hope eventually might actually be taught in schools, because I learned about World War II in school. I learned in depth about World War II. There was a lot of focus on it, but I never once heard about how the queer community was particularly impacted or the fact that all of these years of medical knowledge was literally burned. Like that's, that's important. That like, that, that sets medical advances back a whole lot when it comes to trans folk. I just, it's really strange to try to wrap your mind around that and also around how little is actually spoken about. So anyway, the more people talk about it, the more we're keeping the history alive. And I think it might be important to talk about these things during Pride Month because Pride is a celebration, but it's also so much more than that. There's a whole history that we have, you know? And if nobody talks about history, then as we've seen, history can get lost. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope it was at least somewhat informative. I hope it gives you something to think about or research. I'm going to leave a whole bunch of links in the description. I always leave my sources in the description for the informational or educational videos that I make, so go ahead and check those out if you feel like it, if you want to read up on it. And that's all. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you have a great day and a great week, and you take care of yourselves. All right, stay safe.